All right, so Kathleen and I are here, and we're going to take you from just that great place to some Farm Bill history, which I know you guys really, you've been waiting all day for this, right? And that was just buying time. Uh, farm team, we'll use some baseball metaphors any chance we can. But I know I can speak for both of us. We're baseball fans, so we're still a little starstruck, too, up here. And so we're going to try to try to change gears for you. So um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh, most everyone in the room knows Kathleen Merrigan. I'm pleased to be able to sit here and have a conversation with you about the Farm Bill. For a few of you that may not know Kathleen's uh, a career um, in policy making and organic and sustainable agriculture. Um, we'll go all the way back to the 1990 Farm Bill when Kathleen worked for Senator Leahy in the drafting of the original Organic Foods Production Act. Yeah, through her years where she uh, participated in thought leadership on farm bills from outside of government, through think tanks and universities, and we'll come back to government a couple of times at least, serving as the AMS administrator for a stint. And was that during a Farm Bill implementation, directly after Farm Bill passed? It was, AMS? my focus was really getting the organic rule out. I was uh, administrator for 22 months, and we got out the second proposed rule and the final rule in those 22 months with uh, Richard Matthews and a number of people in the room helping out. And then we'll, co we'll come back around, to, you know, and then uh, Kathleen, of course, served as the Deputy Secretary of Agriculture, most recently is now at George Washington University. So. Um, what I was hoping we'd sort of explore a little bit here is, first of all, you know, we're going to the Hill tomorrow. We're, we're talking about our Farm Bill priorities. Um, why should people, why should businesses care? Why does it even matter? Yeah, um, it does matter because I hear from a lot of people that they want to have changes in the structure and of American agriculture. They want to have a more food systems approach. We didn't end up with the agriculture that we have today without the guiding hand of the government. And so it's important to engage. There are a lot of opportunities um, that not just the Farm Bill provides, but various acts of Congress and, and also the things that are going on in the administration. I know Mark Lipson is here, and when he was the um, the organic and sustainable agriculture advisor for the secretary and myself, he put together an, uh, an online tutorial for USDA staff on what is organic um, that 40,000 people took by the time I had left or by the time he had left. So there's a lot of ways to intervene here in Washington that are very, very important. So businesses should care. We heard from our very delightful keynote speaker about crop insurance. Well, that's a farm bill issue, and that can be a real game changer. And one of the previous farm bills uh, mandated that the secretary um, really engage and do the kind of study necessary to get organic into the game. Organic's not in the game as it should be in crop insurance. We heard that from our um, our keynoter, but there's opportunities to go farther. So I could go down a whole long list and put the audience to sleep, but farm bills matter. Excellent. So we're going to go back to 1990, which uh, for organic was, was you know, the, the, the real big first moment there. With the, tell it, what was it like? What was, going, what was going on at the time? The uh, obstacles, sort of who was rolling through uh, when you were a staffer, who was rolling through talking to you and, and trying to advocate, make their mark on having this happen? And just give us some color about the challenges to get that, to get that written. So um, just by standing up, how many people were involved in the 1990 Farm Bill in this room and were engaged with me in that process? All right, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. It's good for the blood, body and the blood. All right. All right so. <laughs> We're, we're getting old, team, because there's just a few of us. But um, I will say it was a very participatory, collaborative process. I get uh, an abundance of credit for the 1990 Act, but it really was iterative and participatory, and that was important. 
Um, it was a David and Goliath story. So I know some of us are feeling like the odds are not on our side these days in policy in Washington, D.C. Not that organic is a partisan issue. I have many friends who are keen organic advocates in the Republican Party. I, I walk around town with a big D on my forehead. Um, but, uh, but it was a David and Goliath story. Um, Pat Leahy had just taken over as chairman of the Senate Agriculture Committee in 87, and organic is a hotbed topic in the state of Vermont. His, uh, my uh, colleague was Richard Luger, who was the ranking minority member, uh, Indiana uh, senator, and they worked together. In the Senate, it was rocking and rolling, but in the House, the House wanted nothing to do with organic, the House agriculture leadership. In fact, um, the way there was a bill in the House, Peter DeFazio, who you all know from Oregon, he was a freshman congressman. He said, I'll introduce an amendment. And I said, yeah, Peter, thanks. But I'm going to try to look and find someone more powerful than you. But if <laughs> nobody else comes up, you'll do it. I just say that. That was not a knock on Peter, because he's a really effective spokesperson. And he, he ended up getting the job done. But you would really hope that you'd get someone who had seniority, who had longstanding relationships, that had IOUs out there. And we didn't have that person. But um, Peter introduced the amendment, uh, the whole bill as an amendment on the farm bill process because the committee refused to include it. And both the chairman of the committee and the ranking minority member at the time spoke against the amend amendment. But we built an incredible coalition of environmental groups and consumer groups who worked with the organic industry. And we rolled the House leadership. And it became part of the House farm bill. And then we went to conference. Interestingly, um, I'm not a historian, but I will tell you a couple of things that, since a lot of you weren't involved, and uh, it's a getting to be a younger crowd as I get older, there are some things that dro dropped out of the 1990 Farm Bill that people don't remember. Oh, tell us about uh -huh. that. So the Senate, um, we ended up with the National Organic Program, the certification part of um, the bill. But the Senate actually had a few other pieces. I was just looking at the Senate Farm Bill this morning. Boy, I'm a big party girl. I'm a lot of fun. Everyone wants to hang with me. <laughs> Anyhow, um, there was a research and promotion uh, uh, part of the farm bill that was part of the original um, bill that went out from Senator Leahy. In the end, the Senate um, Agriculture Committee decided it was a little too premature for a research and promotion program because we didn't even have the certification program up and running. So it was, you know, organic wasn't fully defined. But the Senate bill included a provision that the secretary set up an advisory committee to um, determine whether a research and promotion program made sense, and if so, to um, give a report on how a referendum should be structured and how the whole program should be sh structured. Now, when the House and the Senate went to conference, that was dropped. But isn't that interesting where we are in time today? Yeah. Another thing that was in the Senate uh, Agriculture Committee um, the, and passed in the Senate, the bill that passed in the Senate, was a piece on transition to organic. So I'm, I'm just like, you know, going in history. This is where I brought my glasses. So um, <laughs> it said the committee, in the committee report, it says the committee believes that the utility and impact of a national transitional label merits study. The secretaries are required to undertake a transitional label demonstration program in order to evaluate the impact the label would have on consumer purchasing decisions and organic markets, and to assess whether the availability of a transition label would provide a significant incentive to motivate farmers to adopt organic production practices. The label shall state that the agricultural product has been produced in transition to organic and shall bear the seal of USDA. And then it went on to have four states be a part of that demonstration pro process. So now, that was also dropped in the 90 Farm Bill, Laura, but look where we are today. So these are two issues. Um, and, oh, there was also a research part that was dropped. So like, here are the three issues that we're sort of thinking about as we go into what may be the 2018 Farm Bill. And to me, it suggests um, how long sometimes a process this policy making is. That was 27 years ago. 
And we're still, Catherine, I know, oh my God, honey, we're so old and so hard, this work, isn't it? But, but I mean, it, it really takes a lot of brutal work and diligence and at the same time, an optimism because otherwise you can get really dragged down the rabbit hole really quickly, right? You have to believe it can happen. That organic um, certification program in the 1990 Farm Bill went much faster than anyone could have predicted, really. Um, the other parts didn't follow on, but maybe we're at that point again. Who knows? That's awesome. That's great. So stuff takes a long time. What was the first uh, farm bill that included mandatory dollars for the Organic Research Extension Initiative? Oh, God. Who knows that? Mark, where are you? 97. Oh, yeah. Where's Mark Lipson? 97 was the first time research was talked about. It was a 96 farm bill, but they had a little research farm lit bill, or well, I don't know, it was like a little research bill that happened in 97. But it was really 2002. $3 million a year in 2002. Yeah. And that was, that was a watershed because it was a, a program for organic. And now the, the last farm bill we worked on, if everyone, for folks who uh, followed it or if you did not, the farm bill expired, and then we were without the bill, and the underlying programs get funded. Our organic stuff sort of fell away with the farm bill came back. But all this discussion around this idea of baseline, and I know for me, uh, uh, that's always been a complicated thing to get my head around, and why that's so important. And I was looking back at OREI being funded at two million in 2002, and then Congresswoman Pingree and uh, Mr. Panetta and Mr. Newhouse's bill that they ju it just introduced to get OREI funded at 50 million. So talk a little bit about why 50 million is kind of that magic number in terms of baseline, what that means, and that evolution. I am such an exciting speaker here today. Let me see. Uh, so I think the important thing is there was an evolution from a research authority for organic research that would then have to be fulfilled with discretionary dollars, meaning the appropriations committees on an annual basis put money into that fund, to when we got mandatory dollars, which means that unless Congress does something destructive, that money is there to be spent. It's a sort of an automatic. So that's how the government spending is, with mandatory and discretionary. So this is the big week when the president's budget proposal came out. And as many of you know, the, there was language about some severe cuts in the SNAP program, the food stamp program, and also some of the farm bill programs. And you saw pretty quickly a statement that came out from the House and Senate chair people saying, you know, these are interesting proposals. We'll, you know, consider them in the farm bill. Basically, that was a salvo saying this is mandatory dollars, not the annual appropriations bill. And so um, it's interesting, but not um, immediately relevant. That said, um, the president has proposed significant increases in uh, defense spending, homeland security, veterans affairs, and that money has to come out of somewhere. So that means a 21% proposed cut to domestic programs and these additional proposed cuts in mandatory programs. Would they all come together? Baseline is like, what, what, how much money does the, does the committee have to spend? And um, that's predetermined. There's a whole budget process that regulates that. The interesting thing for farm bills is that, um, particularly this one coming up, there is a possibility it could be wrapped up, rolled up in what we call a reconciliation process. Isn't this fascinating? Mm -hmm. you're, you're loving this, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is when, when, and this is makes this would make the the farm bill is um, really a budget bill, and it's about um, the budgetary implications of a farm bill. So you wouldn't be putting new creative programs on. Anything that happened, the farm bill would really have to have budgetary Im implications, and therefore it wouldn't be a particularly interesting farm bill. But it would, in some ways, be a way that could fulfill some of the president's budget proposals, assuming that Congress would want to enact some of them because the farm bill would become a budget bill. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah? okay. 
<laughs> I don't know. It's really fun stuff. You know, if you uh, live and breathe in this town, you know, some people say, I'm so many years old. I made some references to age already. And then some people will be fun. They'll say, I'll put that in dog years, you know. But in, um, in, in Washington, D.C., in ag policy circles, the first thing that you sort of throw out there is, like, how many farm bills have you been involved in? <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> Something. So we have a, you know, uh, what is becoming, an, you know, an increasingly, uh, I would say, chaotic environment that we're going to go into this farm bill with, with, with the budget. When I was looking back at, at the farm bills, when I first got to the Organic Trade Association, it was at the tail end of the work on the 08 farm bill. And a lot happened for organic. It was a good bill. It was a good bill for organic. I mean, like, a lot happened. So what were the dynamics happening then that allowed such progress to happen in, in, in that bill? Because that's where we think of sort of the, the, the big pillars, institutional programs uh, uh, that support organic it was it was it was a it was a it was good for organic. Was so really what was good, what was going covered, on that like, that got that to happen? Well, yeah, you had some great champions in Congress. I think that the industry was starting to come to town. Good luck tomorrow. Those meetings are really critically important that you take the time and meet your members and let them know how important it is in their district. They were starting to see some of the numbers. You know, organic wasn't this tiny little niche thing that they could ignore. It was real jobs in their districts. It was, um, you know, more and more people wanting to get it in the marketplace. So, you know, I think it was some of it was political stars aligning, but some of it was just the evolution of the industry and and starting to have some success and saying we want our fair share. Not that organic has its fair share yet. When you look at its market, you know, reach, and when you look at the equivalent federal resources that go to support organic, you don't have your fair share, and that should be part of your message tomorrow. So as we, you know, think about programs to continue to evolve them, what, um, well, first of all, do you have like a, like a, a favorite part of the farm bill that you think is underutilized that we need to be thinking about in terms of using existing tools for organic? Is there, are, you know, what do you think we're not using to its full Probably, utility. probably everything, really. So Eleanor Starmer's here with me. She's now working with me at GW, the nation's loss is my gain. And um, she was the last AMS administrator and really strong supporter of organic. Mark Lipson's here. We're working on an organic uh, policy leadership institute for young people. And part of our concern in, in launching that is that there are these government programs that become sort of captured by different audiences. And I don't think it's because of some evil, sinister reason. I think it's just because government programs are generally hard to access, and people don't know about them, and there's paperwork tricks to the trade. And we want to let a whole lot of young people in on it. Now, if I had a, a title or a part of the farm bill that needs TLC right now, it would be rural development. Yeah. Um, and it's really interesting, the proposal that's come from USDA to reorganize rural development. Um, I think it's critically important to everything we do. If we're going to bring the next generation of farmers and ranchers on our working lands, um, let me tell you, these kids are not going to want to leave college and go out into rural areas and leave their iPhones back on campus. Mm -hmm. We need to have broadband access, and we still are um, not through that agenda in the way we should be. Um, there are all kinds of things we can do creatively in rural communities because people are not going to want to live there and raise a family there if there isn't a little bit of a, a community, um, maybe a bank if you're lucky, somewhere to buy a few things. So um, we saw loud and clearly, I think, at the last election that there are great swaths of this country where people feel like they have not been heard. And I think really working on a robust and creative piece of legislation around rural development is timely. I don't think people, I mean, I come from rural, um, but 
the other thing is when you read the stuff in the newspapers or the, the talking heads on, on television, it's like rural America is this kind of one kind of place. And for those of us it, from rural areas, they're really different kind of places. And so you need a kind of robust, complex, uh, innovative approach to help these variety of communities out. So I think that the, rather than reducing the support for rural America, I think right now we need to stand it up more than ever. And I think that's one of the things that we've been really interested in is looking at the rural development title and how critical that is. And then you have that sort of colliding with uh, the place that is being, you know, reduced in terms of emphasis at the same time. So that's going to be a very interesting conversation as, as we get in there. I've noticed that Congressman Tim Ryan is here, Kathleen. So I think I'm going to ask you if you have any final advice for us. You know, what, what are your hopes for us to accomplish this round, given everything that's going on? So, so you know, where's your bar? Where's your bar for us as an industry? What does it look like for us to be successful in this environment? I think it's important to redefine success in this environment. I don't think this is going to be an ambitious farm bill. If it's a regular farm bill, um, not the reconciliation process, I think um, a lot of energy will and money will go to bringing cotton back into Title I. There'll be some work around helping out dairy. And other than that, I'm not sure it's going to be a very ambitious farm bill. And you're sitting there and saying, Kathleen, I came all the way to Washington. I got all these means set up tomorrow. And what in the world are you telling me right now? I'm telling you that you have to be here in town to maintain what you have and have the power to say no. And then also to be ready, if I'm wrong, if other people are wrong, like to pivot and be ready there and have those relationships. So I, I get concerned when some people are saying, well, you know, let's just put all our effort in California or Oregon or Massachusetts or where, you know, where innovation is going to happen at the state or the local community level. And I'm thinking, you know, you cannot pull stakes out of Washington. The decisions here impact what you do so much. And even if it's not the artistic drawing of a farm bill that we would love to have, you gotta be there. That's my final word. Thank so, you so much. Thank you.